Last week we talked about this dangerous prayer called search me. Search me, O God. We used Psalm 139 as a text. And it was search me, O God. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. Kind of an exposing prayer that says here is something, God, here's my life. Search me. It's kind of like opening up the case and, and you can look at my heart, God. You can look at me. Today we're going to go a little bit step further. And today is probably one of the most dangerous prayers you could ever pray. There's one today that this is probably by far out of the three that we're going to hit last week, today, and next week. This is probably the most dangerous of the three. And it's a prayer that I'm going to warn you, and I'm going to tell you right up front, some of you will not like this prayer. Many of you might even refuse to pray it, but I'm simply going to tell you up front it's not a common prayer and it doesn't feel good it goes against this idea of God will make your life better version of Christianity this prayer though if you'll pray it with a sincere heart has the potential to not only open up your heart to the work of God but you, it'll open up in a way where he will change your life forever and this prayer is just simple God, break me. God, break me. Very dangerous prayer. I remember I was at CBC, Central Bible College, um, in Springfield, Missouri. It's a college that doesn't exist anymore. I'm not bitter. They uh, combined with another school in town, and, and this, well, maybe I am a little bitter, but I'm working through it. And at one of my classes in Bible college was just entitled Seminar. And I love Seminar class because what Seminar class was about was every week they would have a different pastor from all over the United States and sometimes even missionaries come in and they would do a whole week on a certain topic. One pastor, one week, a certain topic. It was cool because, you know, if you got a teacher that was super boring, you knew next week you got another one. Right? And so this one particular pastor, he came in, and, and we were honored to have him. His name is Pastor James Hamill. He was the pastor of First Assembly of God in Memphis, Tennessee. He was an older man. He's since gone to be with the Lord. And I remember the first day of class, it was a Monday, and, and usually they would come in and they would hand out their, their things that they were going to talk about all week and give us those lectures and stuff. But he didn't come in with any kind of paper. He came in and he grabbed a hold of the stool, it was a lot taller than this one, but this will work. He grabbed the hold of his stool, and he had his glasses down on the end of his nose. And I remember him looking over his glasses, and he looked at every one of us like he's looking right through us, and he said this, I want you all to know that God will break you. I'm back in my seat, and I'm thinking, oh, yippee. Because that's not something you really want to sign up for, is it? That's not something that whenever I thought, I, when I thought I was going into ministry, I thought all this glamorous stuff and it was going to be amazing and it was going to be awesome. And I've got this pastor who's been doing this for a long time. He's been what we would call successful in ministry. And the first thing he says on that Monday morning is he says this, God will break you. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. What have I got myself into? I didn't know how true that would be. This morning, I'm going to share a couple of things and just kind of let you know a little bit. Last week, we have four points. It was bang, 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 bang. And uh, this week is not going to be like that. This week, we're going to look at a couple of passages of Scripture. As we look at these passages of Scripture, it's going to be more of a plea. I'm going to be presenting you a plea from, from the Word of God today about this idea of being broken. I'm going to share a couple of stories with you from my own life of, of what that has looked like in me. But every one of us in this room, if you've served the Lord very long, you probably have a, a story of your own that you could tell today as well. One of my stories was this. That we had been, my wife and I had been out of ministry for a little bit of time. It was probably a few months. And it was actually before we came here to be your pastor. 
And we were sitting in my grandmother's home. We had been, like I said, we'd been out of ministry for a while and just been working jobs in the normal job world. We weren't doing ministry full time. And we had this thought, you know, and, and you know how the devil kind of plays with your mind. And, and we were just in a place where we were broken before the Lord. And we're like, God, are you done with us? Are you done with us in ministry? Now, my grandma kind of lived out a little bit. And just about the time, I think the, there was crickets out by her, our bedroom window. And I think just about the time that uh, we went to bed, these crickets recognized the light. And, and when the light went off, their legs started working. You know, kind of. And, and it wasn't just one. It felt like a colony. I mean, it was just, whoo, like big old loud things of crickets. And so we, we're sitting there. We've got the light off. And we're just kind of, we've we're, got tears in our eyes. And we're just, God, we don't know what you want to do. We're in a broken place. And my wife says this. She says, God, if this is you, let these crickets stop. If you're not done with us, let these crickets stop. And immediately, those crickets quit. It's like God held their legs apart. They quit. It was probably about a minute that it was silent. And it's in those moments of brokenness. You're going to hear me say this again. It's in the moments of your greatest brokenness that God can bring about the greatest blessings. But you have to be willing to be broken. It's a dangerous prayer. God, break me. I couldn't imagine, as I look back at my life and I think of all the times when, when I've lived through this prayer, I, I couldn't imagine the, the time that we go through it. But on the other side of it, I've seen a greater blessing and a greater intimacy with God than the pain that I experienced at the time. Because I was willing to go through the idea of God, break me. Not all of you will like to pray this prayer, and, and to be honest, it's not my favorite prayer to pray. It's kind of like praying for patience. Have anybody ever made the mistake and done that? You pray for patience. God, give me patience, and then he tests you in patience. This is kind of like that. But I'll guarantee you this, if you'll take these dangerous prayers to heart and you'll not only take them, but you'll practice them, I believe you'll start to see a move of God in your life that you have never before ever seen happen in you. Some of you won't pray this prayer. And let me just be honest, you don't have to pray this prayer, but it's been my experience that God has a way of breaking you. If you're a believer, God has a way. You know what else has been my experience? It's a whole lot easier and there's a whole lot of less pieces that shatter when I lay myself down and say, God, break me, than when God does it for me. And so today we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about a passage of Scripture here in Mark chapter 14. It's actually two stories that are right here in the same they're in the same verse of Scripture. We're going to read, the first one is in Mark chapter 14, verse 3. It says this, While he was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he said at supper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of ointment, a very costly spike nerd. She broke the jar and poured the ointment on his head. Heavenly Father, I pray today, would you give us just an understanding? Holy Spirit, would you speak to us today about the thing that you want us to hear? God, I pray, let me communicate this clearly, God, because I think it's one of the most incredible things that we can learn to do is pray these dangerous prayers. I pray you help us, God, today in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, this is the story of a, a, a prostitute that had come before the Lord. She had brought her perfume. We're going to get to that in a minute. But it's hard to imagine what life would have been like for this prostitute because nobody in the first century wanted to be one. 
It's not like she said, well, hopefully when I t- the time I turn 21, I can, I'll be in the top 10% of the prostitutes in my community. It's not like she said that. Nobody wanted to do this. In fact, if you were a prostitute, it was only because life dealt you a certain kind of cards and you found yourself that there was no other way to play them except for this desperate plea. Because you see, prostitutes were hated, they were despised, they were uh, full of shame. She may have been a single mom. You wonder what would have led her to this. She might have been a single mom who had to take care of her, ch- her children. She might have been um, someone who was abused by men and didn't really know anything else. But one thing was for sure, all women hated her and most men used her. But one day, she met a man who treated her different. Maybe for the first time in in her life, a man showed her honor and respect and dignity, loved her in an appropriate way, and it transformed this woman so much that she wanted to worship him in a sacrificial way that was beyond what anything that she could imagine to do. And her extravagant act of worship completely confused everybody else in this story. I want you to look at this passage. We have it on on the screen. It says, Jesus was visiting. He was in the house, reclining at the table of a man named Simon the leper. Simon the leper. And this sinful woman walks in in, in, in Luke's gospel as well. It, It talks about how she has this alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. First thing I want you to look at, though, before we get started is, whose home was Jesus in? Simon. What was Simon? He was a leper. (laughs) Most people stayed away from lepers, but not Jesus. Jesus befriended them. He healed them. And you stop to think about this for just a moment. Jesus is the rabbi. It's kind of the beginning of a bad joke. A rabbi, a leper, and a prostitute walk into a house, right? But you've got this scenario that's taking place here. And she comes in with this very expensive perfume. Before I go any further, though, I've got to explain to you the perfume. You see, the, the perfume was very valuable. In fact, it, we found out later in the gospel that it was valued at one year's wages. One year's wages. Just imagine how much you make in a year. One year of your life, how much wages you make in a year at your job. And that's how valuable this perfume was. It was so valuable because it was extremely, incredibly rare and very difficult to get. It was expensive. Ordinary women of those days did not wear perfume because of the cost. Today, you can, maybe if you're sitting next to somebody, you can kind of smell perfume. You can kind of smell, because we, we like to make ourselves smell good. I do. I don't like to be offensive. Right? Right? We like to make ourselves smell good. In those days, they didn't use perfumes to do that because of the cost. Matter of fact, if a woman who wore perfume were to walk by, it would be a signal to guys immediately. They would catch their attention, and that was the purpose of why they wore it. It would catch their attention, and a guy would turn his head and say, Ooh, she must be available. Basically, this perfume was a calling card. You invested into your money into the perfume so that when you got, walked by a guy, you could catch his sense of smell. It was very, very expensive. It was worth a year's worth of wages, as I said. But it was essentially her draw to gather her income and business. She's got this incredibly expensive perfume, and the next part of the verse says that she does, what what does she do with the jar? She broke the jar. She broke the jar. And then what does she do after she breaks the jar? She pours it on Jesus' head. She broke, and then she poured. She broke, 
and then she poured. I want you to remember those two words. They're emphasized on the screen for a reason. We're going to get back to it in a little bit. Now, some people that day, when they saw her doing this, they had a, my, my grandmother would call this a conniption fit. They had one of those moments when it was just like, what are you doing? Right? Can you see that in slow motion? She breaks it and she starts to pour and then some of the people around her are like, no. Right? It it just, one of those moments in scripture where you just kind of see it that way, right? And you start to think, well, wait a minute, time out. You know, because we want to be super spiritual about this. And we're going to say, well, she was just, uh, you know, giving all that she had. And we're going to talk about that in a minute because that's what she did. But some of you, you would have been the same way and I would have been this way too. It's a year's worth of wages, right? I probably would have said, hey, can we give him a drop or two? Can we take maybe a, maybe a quarter of it and pour a quarter of it on it and then Let's say, what? Well, let's go sell the rest. If you're not going to do that, that's great. Awesome. Let's go sell the rest of it, and we can feed the poor. Let's go sell the rest of it, and we can do something great, man. We can, we can do something amazing. And they're having this moment of, of everybody around her is just like, this is too valuable. I can't believe you're doing this. But this woman is saying this. I don't care how much it costs because I'm giving my whole life. See, wrapped up in that jar was her past. Wrapped up in that jar was the sin of her past. But you know what else is wrapped up in that jar? It was her future. Her life savings was probably in that jar of ointment. And she says, no, no, no. I am going to break it, and I'm going to leave my past behind. I'm giving my future, my source of income, my life, my everything away. Jesus, you've loved me so much. I'm going to break open my life, and I'm going to pour it out on you. It was the most valuable thing that she possessed. I will break it, and I will pour it, and I will pour all of it. Broken and poured. The second story is also in that chapter. If you go down to verse 22, Mark chapter 14, verse 22, Jesus is having his last meal with his disciples. He's gathering together with those folks and and he knows what's coming. He knows that he's about to give his life up on the cross. And the Bible says this, it says, as they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread and he asked God's blessing on it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take, for this is my body. And he took the cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it and he gave it to them and they all drank from it. He broke and poured. Broke and poured. He said, this is my body that's broken for you. And then in the cup, it represents the fact that his blood was poured out for us. My blood will be poured out, broken and poured. You know, Luke reports on the same story, and all the disciples are there, and Luke writes about it, and he told this story almost the same way, but he added something and picked up on something that Mark didn't in his writing. And Luke says it this way, in Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, he says basically the same way, but he says at the end, he says this, he says, do this. He broke his body, and he says, do this in remembrance of me. You think, what is that? What, what, what does that come from? Most of us w- would agree that, that whenever we see that, we think of the communion table. We do this in remembrance of him, and that's exactly so. I believe it says it right here on the front. It says, do the remembrance of me. And, and, and that's exactly right. Whenever we partake of communion, it is an act of us celebrating what God has done in our life. It's celebrating the fact of, of that he broke, his body was broken for us, and that he poured himself out for us. 
in doing that. Do this in remembrance of me. All scholars, everyone in here today will probably agree that that refers to the celebrating of communion or the Lord's Supper. But I want to challenge your thinking just a little bit to think maybe it means a little bit more than just that. It definitely means that, but maybe it goes a step further. Jesus says to do this, and what is he doing here? Yes, it certainly means to celebrate. Yes, it certainly means to remember. But perhaps it also means because he was broken and poured out that we ought to live our lives the same way. As you think of me, do this in remembrance of me. Be broken, be willing to be poured out because aren't we commanded to live as God lived? Aren't we commanded to live as Jesus lived and to love as Jesus loved? And we're to die to ourselves daily so that we can live for his glory to be broken every day and be willing to pour out of ourselves every day. So this idea of do this in remembrance of me, for years you think about that as being a celebration of communion, and it is. But it's also a celebration and a marker that says, listen, this is the pattern that I want for your life, that you are not just somebody that's doing it out of ritual, but you are honestly thinking about, I want to be broken. I want to be poured out for the kingdom. It's about praying this prayer. God, break me. There's a saying, and it'll come on the screen here in just a minute. It says this, we impress people with our strengths, but we connect through our weaknesses. We impress people with our strengths, but we connect through our weaknesses. If we could get that up, please, thank you. Let me say it this way. We connect people with our strengths, but we connect most deeply through our brokenness. Isn't that true? We impress people with our strengths, don't we? We're impressed by that. Pastor Dustin, man, he comes up here and plays this piano. He is amazing. I mean, he tickles those ivories. He just, he's really good at that. And I'm telling you that right now, I can't get up here and play Mary Had a Little Lamb. I would be terrible. If, if worship was dependent upon me playing the piano, we'd be doing a cappella. I can't do that. I'm impressed. Those kind of strengths, they impress us. But also, have you noticed that sometimes people's strengths that impress us also irritate us? And we say something like this, oh, I don't even like them. I hate her. Why is that? She is so perfect. She just walks around like she's got it all together. She never has a problem, never has an issue. I hate her. And then all of a sudden, we recognize that they have a problem and an issue. Something happens, and we change our tune. It's like, you know what? I like her. She stinks too. <laughs> you know, I, I, I kind of like her. She's insecure too. We impress people with our strengths, but we connect to our brokenness. There's an author, his name is Dr. Henry Cloud, and, and he says this. He says, I am really convinced that God made the tear ducts in the eyes for a reason. <laughs> when I read that, I had to pause for just a minute and, and just think that through. <laughs> Aren't you glad your tear ducts are in your eyes? I mean, think of, think of some other places your tear ducts could be. I mean, the most logical place would be your nose, right? <laughs> your tear ducts in your nose. Because your nose runs anyway, right? I just run your nose. But that's not super attractive to look at, you know. <laughs> Somebody's going through a hard time, and then all of a sudden they're crying out of their nose. That's, uh, that's kind of gross, you know. And, and, then, and then you stop to think about, you know, the next place would be like the ears. You got two of those, right? So let's put the teardrops in their ears, and, and you know, there's water coming out of your ears. That would be really good, except for the fact if you wanted encouragement, you'd have so much water in your ears you couldn't hear anybody. <laughs> Sorry, I'm digressing. He, he says this. He says that I think the reason it comes out of the eyes, he says, I can't prove this, but I just think that God perhaps designed tears to come from your eyes because you were designed by God to have one looking, someone looking you in the eye when you're hurting so that you could feel their love. 
I like that. And maybe, maybe God in his infinite wisdom allows us to cry because someone else should be connecting with us eye to eye when we're breaking. Can I just get back to this thought process? God will break you. I would have had probably that same response as everybody else is going to have. I don't want to pray this prayer at this time. I couldn't, it, I, I just, I can't do that. But let me just tell you this. Every time I've been willing to pray this prayer, every time I've been willing to live this out, every time I've been willing to walk this through, the blessings of God on the other side are so much better than the breakings. The, bless, the breakings caused extreme blessing. It caused closer intimacy with God, closer intimacy with those that I love. By being willing to say, God, break me. Life's greatest breakings often lead to God's greatest blessings. As I said earlier, I was going to share a couple stories. This one particularly is one I have never shared other than this first service this morning. I don't believe I've ever shared this in a public setting. I was youth pastoring in East Dalton, Illinois. And uh, that was kind of a rough place for ministry for us, but uh, God was gracious and he was good, and I was just doing the ministry thing. Man, I was going all. My family and I, some of you know, we were from Terre Haute, Indiana. It was about two and a half hours from uh, the place where we were ministering. And, and uh, my wife and I, we, went on a, we had a little baby at the time, a little baby boy. He couldn't have been a few months old. We're on our way back to Terre Haute, I think just so that the grandparents could get their baby fix, because that's important. And we're coming back, and it was like super quiet on the ride back. <clears throat> How many of you know, guys, when it's super quiet, that's a warning. That, that's, a, that, that's not a good thing usually. It's super quiet on the way back. We get about an hour into the trip, and my wife looks at me, and she says, this. I'll never forget it. I don't want to do this anymore. Kind of caught me off guard. I said, don't want to do what? I don't want to do ministry anymore. And if you're going to do ministry, I can't be with you. I was broken. I remember that day. That pierced my heart. I got down on my face before God for weeks, begged God, pleaded with God, God, don't break up my marriage. Don't break up my home. God, show me what I need to do. Show me, God, what I need to change. And you know, over a period of time, God began to speak into my life some things that I needed to do. See, I had my priorities all mixed up. I love God, man. I was going after God with all my heart. He had called me in the ministry. And I put the ministry and my family on the same level. And sometimes even the ministry ahead of my family and my wife. And I repented before God. And I said, God, I'm so sorry. And I began to make changes. I began to think differently. I began to do things differently. And obviously, you know the end of the story. My wife's sitting right over there. And yeah. And I'd like to say it was all because of me, but it wasn't. It was because both of us allowed God to do something in our heart. We both got to the place where we were desperate and broken. And we said, God, will you break us and show us what we need to work on? I'll never forget that day. It changed my ministry. It changed my marriage. It changed my life. And today I'm standing before you as someone who says, you know what, I know what brokenness feels like. There are some of you out there that you could preach this sermon better than me because you're in the middle of it right now. You're in the middle of brokenness. You're in the middle of being hurt. Everything around you seems to be shattered. Can I just give you a word that says this? If you will be faithful and let God handle your brokenness, the blessings on the other side will be so much better. If you'll let God handle your brokenness, 
Because life's greatest breakings often lead to God's greatest blessings. Today, maybe you're here. You don't want to be broken. (laughs) I just, I laugh at that because it's kind of inevitable. There will be times when you will be broken. You may never pray this prayer. You may never want to pray this prayer. And that's okay, but can I just tell you, there's going to be times when you're broken, and I wish, you see, the day that my wife told me that, my life shattered. I'm thankful that I had it enough time to be able to do something about it, and she didn't wait to tell me, and we could work on it together. But if you wait too long, when things shatter in front of you and you're broken, it's a whole lot more shrapnel. It's a whole lot more pieces it's a whole lot harder to put back together. It can be done. God's gracious and he's good and he does those kind of things. He blesses that way. But can I also tell you, if you will be proactive in this and you'll be willing to pray this dangerous prayer that just says, God, I want you just, Lord, would you break me? The shrapnel is a whole lot harder, easier to take. And God will begin to speak to your life. Some, some of the people in this. Let me just kind of tell you this. This is, uh, this is not advanced Christianity. <laughs> this is basic stuff. This isn't like just for pastors and monks and missionaries and those kind of people. This is for everybody. This is like I'm coming to Jesus. Lord, break my body. Break my sin. Break me of me so that I can serve you with all of my life. I want to be broken and poured. Broken and poured. I want to die to myself. The gospel is an invitation message that says come and die. Die to myself so that Jesus could live within me. You see, that's what the sinful woman was doing. She broke open the jar. She poured it all out. She symbolized it. says, I'm giving you my whole life. When Jesus' body was broken, when his blood poured out for you, it was broken for you, it poured out for you that you might have your sins forgiven. And Jesus is saying, do this in remembrance of me. Just give your life. Be willing to lay yourself down so that I can move in your heart. Our mission as a church, we believe, is to lead people to become fully disciples of Christ. I believe that with all my heart. That's what God wants us to do. The sad thing is, maybe you're here today and, and you're what I would call a partially devoted follower of Jesus. You do it when it's convenient. If you find yourself at any point being partially devoted, let me encourage you to consider praying this dangerous prayer. Because partially devoted won't cut it. Jesus said, you're either all in or you're all out. There's no lukewarm. You're all in or you're all out. Whatever it takes, God, I want to know you intimately. I want to serve you faithfully because I trust you. Whatever it takes, break me that I can know you. You know, there's some of you in this room today, man, you're crazy. You're crazy all in. This is like part of your everyday prayer to the Lord. God, break me. God, let me expose anything in my life. Break me. And to you, I say, that's awesome. Keep going. But maybe there's a percentage here today that I really want to talk about, and you're just going to walk away and say, well, pastor was a little funny today. He made me cry, but that message just wasn't for me. Let me change your mind a little bit. Let me talk to you about that for just a minute, because I want you to hear from God today and apply this to your life. How can this work? How how does this work for me? Last week we talked about this idea of allowing God to search us. Search me, oh God, and know my heart. Know my anxious thoughts. Know, see if there's any offensive way in me. Can I just tell you, if you're one of those people that are having a hard time praying this prayer, God, break me. Let me just tell you to start with the prayer of search me. And when God reveals that to you, 
then you ask Him to break you of those sinful habits. God, break me of my pride. God, break me of my anger. God, break me of my self-sufficiency. God, break me of my lust. Break me of my impatience. Whatever it is there that is keeping me, God, from you, break me of that, Lord. And when God breaks you, on the other side of your brokenness, you'll see the blessings of God begin to happen in your life. Because life's greatest breakings often lead to God's greatest blessings. And there'll be an intimacy with God that you have not experienced before on the other side of that breaking. So today, as we close our time in prayer, I'm going to ask Pastor Dustin if he would come to the piano. Would you consider a very dangerous prayer? God, break me. Would you bow your heads today? Holy Spirit, right now, As we've been praying all week long, I pray that right now you would do your work in Jesus' name. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, you're here today and and there's a tugging at your heart. You're feeling uncomfortable. Can I just tell you, that's the Holy Spirit trying to get your attention. And he's saying, would you let yourself be broken? Would you pour yourself out? Broken and poured. Would you be broken and poured? And there's something in your life, something you've held on to. Maybe it's a mindset. Maybe it's a sin. Maybe it's something that you are struggling with right now. And you say, you know what, Pastor Joe? I just, I feel the Holy Spirit telling me and convicting me that I need to lay it before the Lord. That's part of this breaking prayer. Some of you are here today and you've been broken before, man. You're in a bunch of pieces right now. You're in a difficult situation. And the thing is, is never once in the middle of all of this have you ever cried out, God, would you break me and show me the things that I need to do? You've never once cried out, God, I want to pour out my life for you. So in the middle of this brokenness, God, I want to find you and what you're teaching me. You've just gone through this stage of being broken and broken and broken and God's trying to get your attention through it but you just keep going and and repeating the cycle and repeating the cycle and He's trying to get your attention and you just push it away. You talk about circumstances, you call it life, you call it whatever you want to label it, you're calling it those things but God's trying to get your heart. He says, listen, listen, listen. Would you break? Would you allow yourself to be broken for me? Would you hear what I'm trying to do in your heart and in your life today? And you'd be here and you're honest with the Lord. You say, God, that's that's where I'm at. You're either broken or you're not or the Holy Spirit's doing something right now in your heart and you're feeling that. If you're doing that, we want to pray with you this morning. Would you just respond by lifting your hand, saying, that's me. The Holy Spirit's doing something in you right now. Yeah, hands all around. Hands all around. The Holy Spirit's speaking to your heart right now. Yep, hands all around. I want to be broken. I want to be broken. I want to be broken. Tired of living my life in a broken way. I want God to speak to me in my brokenness. Yeah. Hands all up all around this room. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tired of living broken. On the other side of life's greatest breaks is God's greatest blessings. Here's what we want to do this morning. I'm going to pray a prayer over you. I'm going to pray a prayer with you, and I'm going to pray it over you, but I want you to pray as well. And then here's how we're going to conclude. We've got time. Just so you know, I quit early, but we got time. One of the most incredible positions that you can be in, and if you're physically able to do it, at the end of this prayer, we're going to ask you to just spend about three minutes in the with the Lord. One of the greatest things that you can do is get on your knees as an act of humility. 
And whether that's at your pew, whether that's at this altar, we want to encourage you today, if you're physically able to do this, I want you to be able just to sit down and just say, God, I put myself on this altar broken and poured out before you, God. I put myself here, God, and I want to be somebody that you use. I want to give my life to you. This morning, if you raise your hand, I want you to pray with me as we lift this up together. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray. I pray for everyone who raised their hand and they're dealing with something right now. They're dealing with sin in their life. They're dealing with something, Holy Spirit, that you're, that you're poking at and you're prodding at. Right now, I pray. If, if you raise your hand today and you know what that is, that thing that's a breaking point for you, you know what that is. Would you just right now just begin to say that, God, would you just take this in my life, break me of this and put it down before him. Just pray it to the Lord right now where you sit. God, would you break me of this in my life? Whatever the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you about, whatever situation you're in right now, would you just give it over to God and say, God, I break it before you and I pour out all of my life. I pour out everything, God, and I give my life to you today. I pour it out, God. I want to be broken. I want to be broken before you. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, as those prayers are going up, I thank you, Lord, that on the other side of brokenness is blessing. That your presence is so great and so awesome and so powerful that God, today, I pray that as you're putting pieces back together, as you're putting lives back together, that there's going to be greater intimacy with you than there's ever been before. God, I pray let that happen today in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I know what it's like to be broken. I know what it's like to be in circumstances where I was broken. But God, I pray today that you put broken things back together. This morning, if you're able and you're physically able to do this, if you're not, you can sit there at your pew, but I want you just to spend some time with the Lord. And I just want you to pray that prayer. God, I want to be broken and poured out. Just like that woman did when she brought that alabaster jar of ointment to the Lord. I break myself down today and I pour myself out before you, God. I give you my entire life. I want to live my life like Jesus did. And so today, whether that be at your pew, these altars are open if you want to come here. If you're physically able, would you do an act of humility? This is a part of brokenness. When that woman came in and she began to, to sit, she got down at Jesus' feet and she broke it and then she poured the jar and she worshiped. And so today I pray, let that happen in you. God, today we break ourselves before you, Lord. I want to be broken and poured out, God, today for the kingdom. I want to be broken and poured out, God, today for you. Allow the Spirit of God to move in our lives, God, this morning. That our hearts will never be the same. That our families will never be the same. Our community, our church will never be the same. Because, God, we are broken and we're poured out before you, Lord. Broken. Broken. God, break me. Break me of things that don't please, that aren't pleasing to you. Break me, God, of my attitudes. Break me, God, of my, my heart. Break me, God, of the things that I, I say. Break me, God, of the things that I do. Break me, O oh Lord. Let that be your prayer today. God, in the middle of, of breaking situations, in the middle of things, and people, Lord, who their lives today, they feel like they're torn apart. They feel like they're broken. God, as we lay our life down before you, I thank you, God, that, Lord, as we do that willingly, as we lay down our life willingly, and we ask you to break us, I thank you, Lord, that you've put broken things back together. And you do it for your glory, and you do it for your honor. Thank you, Jesus.